So we've had several questions come in um, while the presentations were going on. Um, Glenn, this one, a clarification, did you say that you consider 50% of the total nitrogen to be plant available in year one? Is this the same whether the manure is injected or surface applied? Yeah, we consider the ammonia portion to be 100% available and 50% of the organic nitrogen portion to be available. And uh, we, we say that's available whether it's uh, incorporated or surface applied. But I would also point out that in our small plot uh, chart, there's about 15 bushel difference between incorporated manure and surface applied manure. And the incorporated is better, and that's a great thing to show farmers. And I, I think nitrogen loss from the surface applied manure would account for a lot of that. Thanks. Um, Bruce, a question for you. Um, in Michigan, we've had a lot of long, harsh winters, lots of snowfall and rapid snow melt. I've been approached by dairies in my area looking for answers on how to account for end losses due to um, leaching from rapid snow melt. Any suggestions? I suppose Glenn might have comments on that one as well. Sure. Nitrogen is such an elusive nutrient to begin with. And in fact, that in, in Ohio, we, we don't have a history of applying a lot of fall nitrogen, fall anhydrous, uh, just because our soils and, and the dynamics of our weather patterns typically do not allow nitrogen to really be credited much from one growing season to the next. Uh, so the elusiveness of nitrogen uh, and, and the conditions that we, a lot of times we do have and are experiencing right now in March, I would agree that uh, it, it's going to be difficult. In those cases, uh, certainly in a manure environment, maybe more so than a commercial environment, the pre side dress nitrate test potentially uh, could be an indicator. Certainly it's not an absolute 100% slam dunk. Um, there's an NCAA uh, reference, but um, the, uh, the fact that nitrogen um, the, the, the side dress nitrate test is potentially a meter to give us an indication if we're still below adequate nitrogen levels, and then we would want to come back in and apply additional nitrogen based on some crop needs. So, Glenn, any other maybe comments? I would just comment that since it is dairy manure, uh, the vast majority of the nitrogen will be in the organic portion. So it would probably be more likely to stay put than the ammonia portion of the manure. So. Again, you won't know until some sort of testing is done, but um, it, would, it basically would need to be carried off with the water in, in the form of sediment. Most of that would be, I would think. All right, thank you guys. Um, a couple other questions came in for Glenn on why you surface apply nitrogen, um, but you addressed that. Um, right, but I would also emphasize that when we go to a drag line, uh, we will incorporate, so we will incorporate manure on corn using the drag line starting in 2014. Our goal is always to incorporate it, always, if at all possible. Thanks for that clarification. Um, Bruce, um, you mentioned soil freeboard with controlled drainage. Do you have ranges of freeboard you feel is best for specific crops? Well, typically in the early growing season, um, certainly through the winter time, a 12 to 18 inch freeboard in the in the upper soil surface is is where we would recommend. So 12 inches, so we wouldn't want to raise those boards to elevate that water any closer to the surface than, than 12 inches. Uh, some some locations that have had a have a, had an abundance of rainfall and and their the water that they've retained. Uh, in the crop field, uh, some farmers have stepped down their control structures throughout the summer months so as to um, make sure that the root development is not impaired by an elevated water level. Uh, so a little difference between control drainage and sub-irrigation, if you have a source of water and you are using the tile system to supply water all summer long and you have an abundance of water, and there's no concern of running out of water, you can leave that water level pretty high. And in some cases, you might actually keep your root uh, growth uh, fairly close to the surface. The risk in that is if you keep your root levels 
close to the surface, and then the water from irrigation then is, is gone or runs out, we then have created a, a shallow root environment on a crop that's probably going to try to establish a, an ear or soybean seed pods uh, with, a, with potentially a lack of water later in the growing season. So again, if you have some uh, an abundance of water, uh, we may start kind of near the surface uh, at 12 to 18 in the early part of the season, and we might, when we have that extra water, step it down, uh, maybe in increments of, a lot of times the boards are seven inches and five inch boards, and we can step that down um, gradually towards harvest. Hope that helps. Another question for you, Bruce. Um, <clears throat> using bioreactors to manage field nutrients, how do you feel about their effectiveness? Yeah, there's a lot of work in that where at the field edge there's a, a vessel or a trench that's been uh, filled with a material uh, with, uh, with the option of running not always all the water through that filter, but a portion of the total discharge water through that medium, whether it's a wood chip or some other uh, uh, material. Uh, the potential is that wood chips, I, if my understanding is wood chips uh, work better on nitrate nitrogen than phosphorus. And then there are some other um, engineered materials that do a better job on on dissolved reactive phosphorus than they do with nitrogen. So it does take a little investment into the, the space available at the field's edge. And then I think the research is still determining uh, to what point will we get to a saturation level in that filter material that we then need to replenish that material so that the filter is once again um, doing what we expect it to do. Okay, and Glenn, this question came in um, when you were presenting. Um, you both may have comments on it, but how do you feel about using drone aircraft to do crop scouting? You know, we I've not got a lot of experience with it. I understand the process and, and uh, agree it'll work, um, but, you know, as far as uh, is it applicable to what we're doing with uh, application rates of manure, Sure, you know, it'd be nice to get some uh, collar differences between uh, where manure was applied and where it's not, because it's very, very vis visible some years, but, you know, I can't comment much more than that. I know at the Farm Science Review uh, there at Ohio State, that, that significant show, I think, was the first year in 2013 when drones were flown uh, as part of a project to introduce that technology into uh, uh, agronomic crops. Amanda, you might even have some experience on that. Um, well, just that I saw it operating there. But um, this next question um, kind of has ties to what we've had a little bit of research done um, with Kevin King and Libby Dayton. Um, but she asks, just to confirm, Bruce, you were only monitoring, monitoring peak concentrations from the tiles. What about overland flow? Speaking to your point about reducing the water runoff with controlled tiles. Yeah, that's a good question. And, and the way our plots are currently set up is just addressing the subsurface water flow. Uh, there's kind of been um, an attack is a little aggressive. Um, uh, on tile drainage, the tile drainage industry in, in the Midwest. And so our, our project here in Defiance is exclusively looking at, we are monitoring only subsurface tile. Whereas Amanda mentioned Kevin King, he has some field edge effects here in Ohio, uh, research plots scattered throughout Ohio, uh, looking at just that, the, the total water dynamic, the mass flow of, of the total water rainfall, uh, comparing how much of that is is leaving by surface and um, leaving by, by subsurface. 